Okay, good afternoon everyone and thanks for joining us for the Positive Choices webinar series. In today's webinar we'll be focusing on teenage parties, gatherings and sleepovers and what parents can do to help make these events as safe as possible for their children. My name's Lucy Grummet, I'm a research assistant on the Positive Choices project and I'll be chairing the session today. You're currently in listen only mode which means all your microphones are muted and we can't hear you or see you. You will be able to ask questions by using the questions box in your control panel. Please type your questions at any time and we'll have a Q&A session with Paul at the end of the webinar. Um, the presentation is being recorded and it will be available on demand via our website. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Positive Choices Project, our aim is to assist parents, teachers and students across Australia to access up-to-date and accurate information about alcohol and other drugs. We also aim to help teachers access drug prevention programs that are proven to improve student wellbeing and can be implemented in their schools. As part of the Positive Choices Project, we provide a series of webinars providing information of interest to parents, teachers, school leaders and anyone working with young people. Coming up later this year, we're excited to present a webinar about solutions to drug use among rural youth. So that's coming up on the 13th of November. Over the series so far, we've covered a number of topics, such as how to talk with teenagers about alcohol use. And if you've missed any of our past webinars, you can catch up by watching the video or accessing the slides um, from our website, positivechoices.org.au. If you haven't already visited the Positive Choices website, I would encourage you to visit and take a look at the range of evidence-based drug resources that are available. Positive Choices was developed in consultation with young people, teachers and parents and we'd appreciate your feedback on anything additional you'd like to see on the site. For example, if you'd like to suggest a future webinar topic, please email us on info at positivechoices.org.au. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Um, Paul Dillon has been working in the area of drug education for the past 25 years. Through his own business, Drug and Alcohol Research and Training Australia, he's been contracted by many organisations to give regular updates on current drug trends. He continues to work on, with many school communities to ensure they have access to good quality information and best practice drug education. In 2009, his best-selling book for parents was released, titled Teenagers, Alcohol and Drugs. With a broad knowledge of a range of content areas, Paul regularly appears in the media and is regarded as a key social commentator, with interviews on television programs such as Sunrise, Today and The Project. Paul also writes a blog where he discusses topical issues of the day, as well as addressing some of the questions and queries he's regularly asked by those attending his presentations. So thanks very much for joining us, Paul, and now uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Lucinda, um, and uh, thank you to the um, the attendees of the uh, the webinar. Um, I don't do these very often, and we have had a little bit of a problem with um, lag in terms of um, the slides coming up. So um, they uh, you'll see that there are, all the Im images have been removed from the slides, which uh, makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. But uh, hopefully, it will mean that everyone can follow exactly what I am saying. If it does get a little bit behind, uh, Lucinda will kind of interrupt. So um, I, I'm going to be talking about a whole range of different things, but before I do, I have been asked to provide a question so to uh, so that you can uh, complete a poll, and uh, that question is now up, hopefully. Um, 300 students that I surveyed from year 10 to 12 were asked um, uh, whether they would have a problem with their parent asking another parent hosting a party, a series of questions. Uh, you can see those four questions hopefully on the screen now and um, three of those questions were not an issue for most of those surveyed. However, every young person, every one of the 300 hated the, the, uh, the, the other one. Um, I'm wondering if you can read through those four quite quickly and uh, see if you can work out um, A, B, C, D, uh, which one was the one they had a problem with and we'll, we'll address that a little bit later. So in terms of what I'm going to present today, I'm going to look at uh, some, some data around uh, drug use and, uh, and alcohol use of, uh, amongst young people, um, then particularly looking at alcohol, because I suppose that kind of leans into the whole parties and gatherings thing. 
uh, why shouldn't young people be drinking? I'm going to look at a couple of research, uh, five, a couple of pieces of research that have been conducted in the part or, or released in the last 12 months that really provide great evidence to support the delaying of drinking. What influence do parents have in this area? Uh, then we'll look specifically at the issue of sleepovers, parties and gatherings and some simple kind of strategies on um, how to uh, or what parents can do to keep their children a little bit more safe. And I'll finish off as I always do in almost all of my talks around three parenting tips that we know can at the very least delay early drinking and illicit drug use, but quite possibly even prevent it. So before we actually move through that, just very quickly, and I'll have to do these very fast because uh, I have a limited amount of time, looking at some data that we have around secondary school students and drug use. This is the data from the uh, 2014 ASSAD survey, which is a secondary school survey which is conducted across the country uh, every few years. Uh, we don't have the 2017 data yet, has been collected, but uh, we wouldn't expect it to look too much di different to this. What you can see there is the most widely used group of drugs by young people are analgesics and you have tranquilizers, sleeping pills, cannabis, inhalants and a range of other illicits which are at very low levels. Now the way I present these when I speak to young people across the country is I present them like this. So I flip them over. This is called the promotion of positive norms. It basically says to young people that if you don't use illicit drugs you're actually in the big group. And certainly in my experience of talking to almost 120,000 young people across the country every year, um, this is an incredibly positive, empowering experience for them. And we always talk about those young people who do use um, illicit drugs, but we never really talk about those that don't. Um, this kind of shows you how trends have changed over time amongst school-based young people. It's really important to remember this is school-based young people. When a young person becomes disengaged from school or they leave school, then you're going to see drug use jump quite dramatically. But what you can see here hopefully is cannabis use has dropped dramatically since the, since the 90s. Um, you can see opiates have dropped amphetamine, although we continue to talk about the, the ice epidemic amongst school-based young people, that really has never been a significant issue across the, across the general school community. Uh, and then you've got the two drugs at the end, very much linked to nightlife, cocaine, cocaine and ecstasy here, um, which certainly are, um, are more likely to be uh, coming to uh, young people's lives once they leave school or if they get engaged in terms of uh, nightlife, going to nightclubs, dance festivals, things like that at an earlier age. So what about alcohol? Um, certainly the rest of this talk is going to be primarily about alcohol and uh, there's some good news and there's some bad news. And um, I just hope that uh, when I tell you the good news, you kind of hold on to it. So when we get to the bad news, you, uh, you keep remembering the good stuff because there is some really good things happening around alcohol in this country um, and very similar around the world, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, what you can see here is those number of young people who had never consumed alcohol. Um, from the secondary school survey again and what you could see at 12 and 13 um, females are more likely to have never consumed than their male counterparts that kind of changes around 14 that uh, quite difficult age group 14 particularly for young women when things are starting to change often people say why are 14 year old girls you know starting to drink at uh, same levels as boys well who are 14 year old girls hanging out with well usually 16 year old boys and um, many times people say, why does that happen? Well, have you seen a 14-year-old boy? Um, realistically, it's not a surprise that 14-year-old girls are, are certainly attracted to, to older young men and certainly hang out with older young men. So have things changed? Are we seeing more or less um, non-drinking, those young people who had never consumed alcohol? And what you can see across the surveys from 2011 to 2014, across every single age group, we have a greater number of young people who are uh, reporting that they have never consumed alcohol. And that certainly reflects my experience across the country where we are seeing growing numbers of young people who are choosing not to drink. Um, has this changed over time, a longer period of time, not just the last couple of surveys? And yes, it has. Um, this shows you how the 12 to 17 year olds who had never consumed alcohol from 1999 to, to 2014. And this next kind of um, statement that I'm going to make, I, I, I really want parents to kind of hold on to because I think it's really important. In 1999, we had about 
one in 10 young people who said that they had never consumed alcohol. It's now one in three. Um, that's quite remarkable. And once again, as I said, it certainly reflects what I see across the country speaking to young people. So that's the good news. What about the bad news? Well, when do they drink? If they're going to drink, when do they drink? Um, and this is a study from um, the Hunter Ridge of New South Wales. You could pretty well use any uh, data that looks at alcohol use amongst young people. Um, and you can see this very similar trend, this one age group where drinking starts to happen in quite a major way. Um, what you could see here is that the, in this survey, researchers went into um, uh, schools in the Hunter region and uh, classified their drinking. You can see blue is non-drinking, green moderate and yellow risky. And I hope you can see quite clearly the year where it kind of all goes nuts. It's year 10, that age around that 15 year old age group where things start to change. It's changed quite dramatically. Why does this happen? Well, it happens for a really simple reason. I believe it's basically because of what parents stop doing around year nine. Year nine is the year where we start to see uh, parental monitoring slip and change. And um, that, uh, that, that change in monitoring um, results in all of a sudden quite a significant jump in drinking occurring. And year nine is the year where we see that starting to happen. So um, if they are starting to drink in year 10, which we certainly know, and of course there would be some parents out there who would say, my goodness me, I say, we have far younger kids who are drinking and certainly there are young people who do drink in year eight and, and certainly in year nine, there's often a core group of kids who are doing it, but it's year 10 where you can't, it hits a critical mass. So if kids are drinking, where are they getting the alcohol from? Well. This is the back to the ASAD survey again, the secondary school survey, where young people are asked where was the most, where was their last alcoholic drink? Where did they source it from? And what you can see here is quite uh, quite clearly that the most common source of alcohol is parents. Um, now that's quite a significant difference from what uh, many parents would say was their first experience where, where they got their alcohol from. If they got alcohol, usually it was from, from friends, older siblings, things like that. It seems to have done quite a dramatic twist where we are now seeing increasing numbers of parents who are choosing to provide alcohol to their child. Um, now, why is this happening? Um, uh, do, I've certainly meet parents across the country who, who do approach me after my talks and say, look, oh, I must admit I'm one of those parents who does provide alcohol and I've yet to meet a parent who provides alcohol for any other reason than um, they believe it to be protective. They believe that if, they're, if, uh, if their child's going to drink, they would much prefer to be the person who provides it to them thinking that that's protective, that that is going to keep their child safe. So what does the research say in this area? Does it say that providing alcohol um, is protective? Well, as I said, there's a couple of pieces of research that have been collected that have been released this year, Australian research, um, that kind of shatter that whole belief of um, provision of alcohol being protective. This is a study that um, came out in January of this year. Uh, about 1,900 um, parents, adolescents were followed over a six year period. Um, so they started, the adolescents were starting to be um, were collected in uh, 12 and then followed through until they were 17. And it looked at parental supply of alcohol and uh, the fact, uh, and was it protective? Did it have a, a positive impact? And its findings received a reasonable amount of media attention when they came out, but what you can see here, and this is a direct quote from the research paper, the final paper, there's no evidence that parental supply protects from adverse drinking outcomes. In fact, the practice is associated with risk. Um, what kind of risks? Well, um, you can see here, well, hopefully we found that parental provision of alcohol to their children is associated with subsequent binge drinking. So they drank more alcohol related harms and symptoms of alcohol use disorder. So at 17, some of these young people were experiencing um, cravings, withdrawals. Um, they're the kind of things that you'd expect from um, uh, alcohol use disorder. 
There was no evidence of any benefit or protective effect. So this belief that if I give it to them, uh, it's they're, they're going to be safer as a result of that. Um, and most importantly, and certainly I've been saying this for most probably the last at least 15 years, possibly even longer, um, parental supply is associated with increased risk of other supply. So if you give them two, they're going to go and actually find two more. Now, this kind of goes against what most parents who provide alcohol um, actually do. They really do believe, well, I'm, I'm giving them two bottles, I'm giving them two cans, that's what they'll drink. And what we can see by this piece of research was that that's just not the case. And certainly, once again, when this came out, I spoke about it with a group of young people and certainly young people didn't like this research. And I've had um, kind of not quite stand up fights, but certainly um, discussions, debates with young people about this. that They believe that they did. They, their intent was to drink what their parents gave them. But in actual fact, when they're around their peers, reward increases around their peers, they're more likely to um, actually make poor decisions. They're likely to drink more. The other piece of research, which I think is really interesting that came out later in the year was this one. Um, quite often with young men, fathers of young men, we hear that, oh, my, my, my son doesn't binge drink. He just has a beer every weekend when he goes out to a party. And um, I hear this from parents of, of uh, parents of young people as young as 15. Um, so is that true? If they're just having one beer, but they're just doing it every week, is that okay? Well, this is, as I said, a study that was released a little bit later. Um, this is an Australasian study looking at a number of different um, kind of samples, 9,000 adolescents, 13 to 30. And um, what this found was, which I think is a really important statement, most robust evidence to date that there's a causal relationship between adolescent drinking. You drink when you're, when you're in your adolescence, greater risk of alcohol problems in adulthood. Um, and, you know, there are many parents who, when they hear this, they go, well, you know, I was drinking when I was 15, 16, there's nothing wrong with me. And what I often say to that is, well, well, is there? You know, are you drinking at safe levels? And I think often people find it very hard to look at their own drinking and, and see that possibly uh, you might be drinking a little bit more. And do you want your child to drink at that level? Most probably not. So what this study found was that absolutely binge drinking is a significant problem and it, it's greater, that causes greater problems in the future. But what this found was that frequency of drinking, so if you are going to go out and just have a couple of beers every weekend, that is just as an important predictor of future drinking problems. So my message to young people, particularly year 11, so my message very strongly is to, to young people of that age, you know, going out every weekend and drinking every weekend is a risk. If you can just have one weekend off a month, that's most probably um, a real positive um, outcome. If you can just get them not to drink every weekend when they go out to, to parties. And uh, that can be really difficult, but of course, um, you know, driving comes into play when they're a little bit older. And so you've got the whole designated driver out, which is uh, really helpful. So, um, <sighs> It, with all that in mind, what can parents do to make sure that their child has healthy attitudes and values around alcohol? Because the reality is if your child wants to drink, um, they're going to. There is absolutely nothing anybody can do to stop their child from drinking if that's what they want to do. Um, so most probably the best that parents can um, for, can hope for is that they can instill some really healthy attitudes and values around alcohol. So um, I think one of the things that is of great frustration to me is that parents believe that as soon as a child hits adolescence, that's it. Um, there's nothing they can do. Uh, their peers become such a major influence that they have no influence at all. And what the evidence shows quite clearly is that you were your child's first and you're going to be their most important teacher. Um, you will always have an influence. Now that influence will change. And um, if uh, there's some great work done where you look at where they where um, parenting experts have talked about that when you're a parent of a child, you have a managing role. But when you move into adolescence, you transition into a consulting role. And it's how you how you manage, how you change, how you make that transition from a manager to a consultant. That is all the difference that makes all the difference. So those years, particularly around that year eight and nine time where your child's going to start pushing your buttons, trying to navigate through that and trying to um, make that transition as gently as possible 
is really important. And as I always say, I think uh, one of the keys here is looking for every opportunity to say yes to your child. You're going to say no a lot because your child's going to want to do things that um, are not safe. Your child's going to want to go to parties and, and sleepovers, gatherings and things that you might not think are safe. And so there are going to be times where you have to say no. But if you could say yes, um, really, really important. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So a couple of things I think you can certainly do in this area that are really helpful. Um, and this is a big one. Um, make your views about underage drinking clear. Um, uh, I give talks all across the country to parents and uh, my, par my parent talks are um, me speaking, parents listening. I made the fatal mistake earlier this year of doing an interactive parent night. I'm never doing that again. Um, I <laughs> ask parents um, to just turn to the person next to them and, and tell them their view about underage drinking. And, you know, within a very short period of time, it became kind of like a, a frat house. Uh, there was uh, a whole pile of arguing and um, disagreement and it wasn't pleasant at all. I think this is an area where parents may think that they know what their views are, but um, uh, they haven't really thought them through and they certainly haven't spoken about them with their partners. And uh, one of the most important things here is that par parents have to be on the same page in this area. If you're not, your child's going to see a weakness in one, they're going to see the weakest link and they're going to attack it. So um, you've got to actually work out what your views are. Um, so for example, if you think that uh, your child should not drink until they're 18, uh, what does that mean? Does that mean on the day they turn 18? Does it mean on the, at midnight when they when they when they turn 18? Are you going to give them the alcohol at 18? Are they going to go out somewhere else? It's really complex. It's a really tough one, but really important to communicate to your child as early as possible what your views are. Um, I think the next one's very, very important, create rules and consequences around alcohol and parties and do it early. If you can create rules before before they go to parties, or, you know, make your rules around parties, it's going to be really important. And the most important thing about any rule in this area is that it has got to be, they have got to be fair and they've got to be age appropriate. What I mean by fair is that um, certainly um, kids have an innate sense of fairness. And if your child turns around and says, that's not fair, it usually isn't. And so, um, you know, you've got to make clear what your rule is, tell your, your expectations, and then um, make sure that they have, um, that they're part, that, um, that it, it's made very, very clear to them what the consequence will be. When I say age appropriate, the most important thing here is here, things have to keep changing. Um, you can't create rules around parties for a 15-year-old and maintain those rules until they're uh, 17. Um, my recommendation is that you just keep adjusting them, getting them back, reward them for good behaviour. And I would say really around the age of 15, 16, every three or four months, bring them back, talk them through. Um, the next two, pr promote positive norms. I think uh, flip the figures as I sh showed you right at the very beginning. We're constantly talking about the kids that do things flip it. So if you hear in the media that one in 10 kids are binge drinking, flip it around and say nine out of 10 aren't. And then this last one is incredibly important because I guarantee almost every parent who's listening has heard that wonderful line, you're the only one who does that. Um, kids aren't used to being challenged on those kind of statements. Their teachers will challenge them, but parents don't usually. So if your child ever says you're the only one, then uh, turn around and just say two simple words back to them. And those two words are prove it. Um, they have to prove that you're the only one. And um, the way I always say to parents is give them a piece of paper, give them a pen and say, write the names and phone numbers of five parents who will. And um, uh, then um, and say, I'm, I'm going to call each one of them and check. If you want to see your child melt behind you, um, as you say that, that's the way to do it. They're not used to being challenged, but they need to be. If they want you to accept a certain um, uh, certain idea, then they have to provide proof that that is actually what is happening. So what can you do to ensure they are safe when they go to a party? Well, the most important thing is that um, they need, that you need to be a parent. Um, this is not easy. Um, I've never met a parent who turns around and says this area of parties, gatherings and sleepovers is an easy one. It's tough. But certainly is a couple of guidelines that I think could help parents. So firstly, what do you do when they're invited and they want to attend? 
The absolute biggest one here is that you're not bullied into a decision. Um, you can't give an answer straight away. This has to be an informed decision and uh, that means you need certain information. The most important thing though here, without a doubt, is that there has to be a united front. Um, look, I have a few mantras that I say to parents that are really important and this is most probably one of the most important ones. You know, if your child comes to you by yourself and says, I want to go to such and such's place, uh, you're lying should be, don't come to me, don't go to them, come to us. What you want to do is make sure that they approach both of you at the same time so they can't set you up against one another. And um, I've made a suggestion to parents right across the country, you know, make a night, um, usually a Thursday night, your child knows what parties they want to go to by a Monday morning and designate a night where both of you are sitting on one side of the table, they're sitting on the other and you go, okay, what do you want to do on the weekend? Uh, then you can address that at that time together and um, that will, um, uh, then it'll give you the option to uh, make all the decisions you need to. So if you then have to make an informed decision, as I said, there were four questions that I tested and I think Lucinda's there to actually respond to that. Are you Lucinda? Yes, that's right, I'm here. So um, the poll from earlier, we've got the results in and Paul, we had 90% of parents saying the question that their children most probably hate is, will the parents be there and actively supervising the party? And they got it absolutely right. Yes. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. I've tested these with, as I said, 300 year 10 to year 12s. And even with the 17 and 18 year olds that I tested these four questions with, three of them, of course, 18 year olds don't want you to call someone's house, but um, they don't have a problem with one, two, and four. It's the third one. And the reason they don't like the fourth one is really simple because it's not a one word answer. It actually involves you talking to the host parents, talking to anybody else. And as any parent would know, uh, the one thing your child doesn't want you to do is communicate with anybody else. So um, the other three are simple. And I think if you tell your child that that's what you, those are the questions you're going to ask, they're the only questions you're going to ask, you're not going to have as much uh, difficulty um, getting them to agree to it. Of course, they're not going to like it, but they're important questions. You can then make an informed decision. So where do you get inf the information from? Well, basically, if you're an idiot, you'll ask your child. And that, unfortunately, is what most parents do. Um, they rely simply on their child. Now, is your child going to lie? Not necessarily, but are they going to tell you the whole truth? Most probably not. If there's something, there's a part of the truth that could prevent them from going, they're not going to tell you. So you need to go to other places. And certainly the best option, of course, is to contact the parents hosting the party. The trouble is this can be difficult. It can be incredibly hard. Um, certainly some parents have nightmares of experiences calling a house and being told that they're over parenting, don't they trust their child? And on the other hand, do you also get the experience where parents will say, thank you for calling, you're the only one who called. But this is hard, this is challenging, and certainly you have a bad experience. Parents do not like doing it again. But I think the most important one, and you know, this is something I feel very strongly about, no matter what school I go to across the country, the key is talk to other parents. If it's not the host parents, talk to other parents you know, your, your child's friends, parents, anybody. The whole thing here is you want to create a network. You want to keep talking to one another. Um, that's what keeps kids safer. Um, I have worked in schools for a very long time. I've worked in schools, I've been to many schools where unfortunately young people have died and uh, young people, people have experienced sexual assault, violence, horrible stories. And um, so many of them have, could have been prevented if parents just talked to one another. They were more aware of what was going on. Um, yeah, every single one, realistically, totally preventable. Um, uh, I've put social media here. This one you have to be very careful about because I don't advocate, uh, advocate, advocate spy, spying on your child, but certainly if you do follow your child, and of course um, any cyber safety person would say that you should be, of course they create fake, um, fake, uh, fake accounts, but uh, looking at social media is a useful tool. 
Um, there's only one non-negotiable as far as I'm concerned in this area, and that is this, how are they going to get there and how are they going to get home? Um, uh, I think if you speak to any um, police officer, any uh, paramedic, emergency worker, they will tell you this is where it usually goes wrong. Realistically, you make this decision, they don't. Um, kids are not going to like this, but realistically, I think right up until in year 11 at uh, you know, 16, 17, they're not really able to make this decision well. And having your child wander around, um, wander at the street, that's where things really go wrong. The safest option, of course, is you take them and you pick them up, but that's not always possible. If you're not, um, if you can't, speak to the parent who, who will be. And when I say speak, I always say use words out of your mouth. Um, don't text. Speak to people. Once again, that's going to create the network. Um, if you are, well, number one, you can drop them off. You get to see where they're going. You can meet the hosts, which would be fantastic. Once again, creating that network, that parenting network. And you can, of course, assess the event, see what it looks like. And when it comes to picking them up, you know what they've been doing and you know what went down. Um, as I always say, winding the windows up as they get in the car and having a good sniff could tell you an awful lot about what went down in the, at, at, that, at that event. I think the next two things are things that I've seen change over the last couple of years, which have got quite frightening, and certainly once again linked to some significant issues and risks. This idea of using Uber as a parenting tool is a great concern. How many young people are using Uber to get and to go to and get back from events and parents absolutely supporting that. As young as you know, 13 and 14 is just beyond me. Um, picking up by text, uh, standing out, sitting outside a house um, and picking up your year eight, year nine year old son or daughter um, from a party. If a parent has actually been kind enough to look after your child for, um, you know, four hours on a Saturday night, uh, go up and say thank you. Now, I get it. In year 10, I think uh, at that age, you've got to start pulling away, but don't sit in your car. Um, get out of your car, shine a torch on yourself, show the host parents that it's another human being picking up a child. Um, I think it's really basically only good manners. And once again, it's about keeping your kids safe. If you take them, you pick them up, you can go to bed knowing that your child is alive, safe and well, and there's not one parent I've ever met who doesn't want that. Um, the last couple of slides, if you do say yes, if you decide that they can go, and my strong suggestion is if you can possibly allow your child to go to any event, these are important parties, sleepovers, gatherings, they are important socialising um, events for young people, um, certainly. Um, you should let them if you can. Now, of course, if it's incredibly unsafe, it's a no. Uh, what I mean by that is your 14-year-old daughter wants to go to a party where um, there are 18-year-old young men drinking. There's no way in the world you can make that safe. But if you don't feel confident about a party, your 15-year-old's invited, it's important for them to go for their socialising. They, they, it's where how they stand, where they stand in their peer group. Um, then you could say, look, I don't feel comfortable, but you, need, you want to go, you need to go. Um, I'll take you, I'll pick you up, and you're there for two hours. You put caveats around to make sure that they are safe. So my last mantra is this, I think um, and you know, most parents understand this, I think particularly parents who are tuning into a webinar like this, um, every time your child leaves the house, you can call me anytime, anywhere, if something goes wrong and you need me, I'll be there. And you keep saying it, you keep saying it every single time. They're not, they're gonna get sick and tired of it, but they need to hear it. And if you say it, you have gotta be available. This basically means your social life is pretty well, <laughs> um, uh, ruined for the next uh, 10 years, um, but you've got to be available. That means one of you is going to have to be sober enough to hop in your car if, God forbid, something goes wrong. Certainly, taxis and Ubers are an option, but I don't think they're always reliable. And do you really want to do that to, um, in terms of keeping your child safe? There's a couple of other things just to talk about before they leave, and I think this is a key one. Um, it's staggering how many young people do not call triple zero simply because they're frightened their parents will find out. You need to tell them you support them in that. Ensure they have the Emergency Plus app on their phone, which I'll show you in one second. 
And then this is a real key, a great one for your sevens, eights and nines to have the name and number of their buddy for the night. So you ask your child, who are you going to be? Who's going to be your buddy, the person who you'll be with for the night? They'll be around you. So if you need to call them, you need to get in touch with them for some reason, they don't pick up their phone, um, you can call their buddy. It's all about getting your child to plan ahead. Incredibly important. The one thing we know uh, gets young people into trouble and adults is that you don't plan. Got to get your kids, if they're going to these events, to plan. Here's the Emergency Plus app. Um, now this is a free um, app, downloadable, developed by Triple Zero. Um, it's, uh, it's a fantastic app. Uh, you put it onto your phone, and my suggestion is as a family, you put it on all together. Um, you click this button here on your phone, and this, this screen will come up. Now this screen basically has the numbers which you push, you don't dial. And then down here, it activates their GPS. It tells them where they are. Most young people on a Saturday night have absolutely no idea where they are. They've been dropped off. And if they do have to call an ambulance, um, they don't know. Um, they don't know where they are. This tells them. It even works when they're not in Wi-Fi. If they're not in Wi-Fi, this doesn't come up the street address. What happens instead is that uh, they get the latitude and longitude. But once again, this putting this onto their phone as a, as a, as a parent tonight um, is uh, what that will do is you, it gives you the opportunity to actually once again talk about triple zero and the importance of that if they if you trust them, you believe that if they're going to do it, they need to. Um, if they're going to, you support them completely in their decision to do that. So to finish off, just a couple of things that I think are important. Um, tell your children they're great all the time. Um, as I said, I work with thousands of young people every year. I've worked with young people for a very long time and uh, it constantly amazes me how amazing they are. We live in a world where um, the media kind of puts, pulls them down a lot. Um, if you believe the media, we have the worst young people we've ever had, where in actual fact, our kids are doing great things all the time. It's so important for parents to keep finding positive things to say about their child as often as possible. Um, listen to your child and connect. Um, try to think, um, try to find a way of keeping connected. It can be very, very difficult for parents, particularly during that transition from that managing to a consulting role, to find a way of connecting. Many parents have no problems with connecting with a primary school child, but in that transition period, you can lose it. It can be a matter of walking a dog together, watching a TV program together, going to the movies, going to a coffee shop, something. It's not about qual quantity of time, it's about quality. If you can only spend two minutes with your, with your child, but it's quality time, then uh, my goodness me, incredibly powerful and uh, keeps, we know, keeps them safer in the future. And then there are three simple golden rules. So if you look at all the evidence in terms of uh, preventing and delay, or delaying or preventing alcohol and other drug use, it boils down to three things, which is really around monitoring. And that is know where your child is, know who they're with, and know when they'll be home. Um, sometimes parents find this kind of confronting because they say, well, you know, if I have to, if I have to follow that up and do that, then my child would think I didn't trust them. As I always say, if you trust your 15 or 16 year old, you're an idiot. You have to trust your child. Of course you do. But can you? Most probably not. They're going to push boundaries. They're going to not always tell the truth. They're not always, or they're just going to kind of leave bits out. Um, you have to follow them up. And sometimes they're, they're going to disappoint you. That doesn't mean they're a bad kid, and it certainly doesn't mean you're a bad parent. It just means they're an adolescent. Um, I think we'll have a proper. I've got a, a proper version of this um, of this presentation on my website, so you can see what it should look like, um, and the references um, on email on Facebook. Um, Drug and Alcohol Research and Training Australia, where I put all my blogs, all my commentary and everything. You can, if you try to find Paul Dillon on Facebook, you'll see a picture of me with a cannabis leaf on the top of my head. Um, some wonderful 16-year-old created a fake Facebook page for me and I could have complained, but I thought I'll leave it up there for um, he was creative. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Instagram shows all the kind of messages I give to kids um, across 
the um, the country. I have about 16,600 young people who follow me on Instagram now, which I am very, very proud of. And that's it. Thank you very much, Paul. That was um, a very informative and interesting presentation. Um, and now I'd just like to open um, up the question time for everyone. So if you'd like to um, just submit the questions um, in the question box on your control panel um, and I will get Paul to answer them for you. So we'll start with one that came through a bit earlier. Um, so this person's asked, what should you do if you make a call to um, parents who are hosting the party and you suspect they are lying about some of the details? Perhaps you think they might tolerate alcohol. What should you do? Look, I think the the reality is that many parents um, have uh, certainly experienced other parents lying to them. Um, and uh, I think that's where the whole thing about trusting your child comes into play. You certainly do have to trust your child at some point or another. Um, I think if you believe your child is at risk um, at a certain party, um, then I, I think you have to say it's you can't go. But um, as I always say, you say no too many times, um, you don't put a little bit of trust in there, then what you're going to experience is your child pulling away from you. And the one thing you don't want, particularly around that age of 13, 14, 15, is your child pulling away. You want to keep connected. That doesn't mean you have to say yes to everything, but you certainly have to say as soon as you, um, as soon as you believe that your child is at any risk, you have to say no. Right, yes, that makes sense. Thanks, Paul. Um, and someone's asked, should you deal with your boys differently to your girls? Um, I often get asked this, I think certainly, I mean, there's a, it's a great uh, new book by Madonna King called Fathers and Daughters um, that um, I would strongly recommend. Um, but it, uh, um, it talks about how fathers relate to their daughters in a different way. And we do know that, you know, parents relate to um, different kids in different ways and genders uh, have, that, have that effect. Um, I don't, I, my personal thing around parties are, it just comes down to basic safety all of the time. Uh, do you know where they are? Do you know who they're, um, who they're with? And do you know where they're going? Um, is, uh, it, if you, it doesn't matter what gender they are. Certainly, I think you've got girls, we know girls um, hang out with older guys. So there's a, an element of risk associated with that. Um, uh, but I think uh, that's about the best you can do. I think you can't you can't turn around and say there has to be if you've got some sons and you've got you've got a couple of daughters if you start if you start actually um, parenting them in a different way there's going to be a lot of <laughs> a lot of grief um, your child's you're the ones who get uh, parented parented more or have more restrictions they're going to rebel pretty quickly. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Paul. Um, and someone's asked. Hi Paul, in respect of knowing where your child is, what is your opinion on having location or tracking apps oh. on your child's phone? Look, I think certainly um, uh, as long as you tell your child that's what you're doing, I think that's absolutely appropriate. Um, and um, most young people who I know who have that kind of, um, who's, uh, who have those on, have no issues with them. I think if they found out that their parents were doing it, um, um, undercover, uh, there'd be a great problem. Mm -hmm. I think as long as you're honest, it, it's about, it's the same following them on any social media. You tell your child, and as I said earlier, um, there are going to be some kids who are going to um, create fake accounts and all that kind of stuff. There are apps apparently that can cause you to, that kids can manipulate to say, well, I'm over here and they're really over there. So mm -hmm. um, even tracking apps can be um, um, manipulated. But once again, it comes, it comes down to being honest, communicating with your child, saying, I want you to be safe. This, these are, if you're going to go, if you're going to start wandering the streets, you're going to places, um, I need to know where you are. And if I'm going to let you go, these are the things I need from you. 
Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And we've had a question about sleepovers. So is there any different advice when it comes to sleepovers? Um, are they allowed? And we've also had a, another one on the same topic about um, sleepovers with mixed genders, whether that's a complete no-no. Look, mixed sleepovers have um, have become a very big thing in the last couple of years. Um, it's the only topic that I've ever really had hate mail about from parents. Um, most parents who read my blogs and do that kind of thing um, tend to kind of share similar kind of beliefs to me. But the, the mixed sleep is when I first heard about it kind of terrified me. I was a primary school teacher way back in the, in the very early 80s and going on a school camp with a group of you know, primary school kids and trying to separate, keep the boys and girls separate at night involved, you know, um, dogs, uh, searchlights and barbed wire. How parents actually manage a mixed sleepovers for 20, you know, 14 or 15 year olds, I find uh, very difficult to imagine. But absolutely those parents who believe in mixed sleepovers, believe in them very, very strongly. And as I always say, if that's your belief and you want to run one, as long as you tell every other, every parent um, of, the, of the, the people you invite that that's what you're going to do so they can make an informed decision, that's their choice. But that's the key. That's the mm -hmm. absolute key. If, you, if you're going to hold a mixed sleepover, then you have to tell every uh, every parent of the child that that's what you're going to do so they, they can actually go yes or no to it. Okay, great. Um, we've had another question um, this time about um, the Mediterranean model. So I think they're referring to when parents give their children a little bit of wine or a bit of alcohol at dinner and sort of introduce them to alcohol in that way. Um, what are your views or what does the evidence say about that one? When I started giving parent nights many, many years ago, um, and I say this in schools now to young people, my final slide used to say, if you have a 15 or 16 year old and they have not drunk alcohol yet, uh, go home tonight and make sure you pour them a drink before someone else does. That was what the evidence used to be. It came from the Mediterranean model, which was that um, uh, appeared in countries like Italy and Greece and to a lesser extent France, that introducing alcohol with a meal in a family context um, taught them responsible drinking and there were lower levels of drinking. Um, we now, I mean, the evidence is pretty clear now. There's been quite a bit of research done looking at the Australian experience in Mediterranean model and that it doesn't work here. Um, certainly quite a bit of research has been conducted now. And of course, we have all this other wealth of information about um, the brain and that, you know, delay, 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 try to delay drinking for as long as possible. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that in countries like Italy and Greece, realistically, the Mediterranean model is not working as effectively as it once did. There are cultural changes that are occurring across the world and um, um, that kind of model is most probably um, not as, I suppose, supported as it once was. That said, and it is very, very important to acknowledge this, no one, and certainly not me, uh, I, I, I certainly can't tell parents what to do in this area, that you have to make your own decision. And if you believe that providing alcohol to your child with a meal um, is, um, is, is the thing that you want to do because that's what happened when you were younger and you believe you can set your family rules and, and teach your child uh, responsible drinking, then that's what you need to do. I believe there are two things that every parent has to do in this area and that's number one, get the best quality information you can. Um, number one, and my aim over the, across the country when I speak to parents is to try to give them the best that I possibly can and then most importantly, follow your heart. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. And um, as I said, I have been involved with a number of deaths across the, over the years of young people, typically year 10s, so 15 year olds who uh, went to parties, drank alcohol, and they didn't make it home. And I can tell you that of the parents who didn't follow their heart, they actually were pushed into doing something that they didn't feel comfortable with and they lost a child. 
to lose a child is tragic and of course you're never going to recover but if you don't follow your heart and something terrible happens um yeah it's it, it's a disaster and uh, I think that's the key. It doesn't matter what I say, it doesn't matter what your best friend says or your sister-in-law says. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Thanks, that's great advice, Paul. Um, I'm sure you possibly get this question a lot, but we've had a few asking what age you think you should allow some alcohol consumption? Because um, obviously people, you know, teenagers probably will drink and yeah what you think about that? Well, I think you've also, I think very importantly, whenever anyone says that to me, you have to acknowledge that there are growing numbers of young people who are not going to drink. And that's really important. So to this inevitable inevitability that everyone talks about, I think is a problem. And if you, uh, I think we have to keep saying that we are seeing growing numbers and it's not just in Australia, it's around the world of young people who are choosing not to drink. So it's not inevitable. So that's really important. Um, uh, once again, it has to be, you have to follow your heart. You've got to look at the role alcohol plays in your life, in your family life. And um, if you believe that, uh, I mean, the evidence is very clear that if they do drink, the best place for them to drink is with you. It should be, their first drink should be with a parent. Um, quite, a, quite a lot of information that supports that that is the best. Now, parents then have to kind of, it's, it, you know, when you look at all of this information that we have through research, it's quite complex. It's like juggling balls because parent information says delay, delay, delay try to stop their first drink from occurring for as, le for as long as possible. At the same time, it's saying that their first drink has to be with you. So you're kind of like saying, okay, well, when do I do that? So I think you've got to look at your own experience, um, talk through, as I have already said, what your views, your views around underage drinking are, talk it through with your partner, and then come to a decision about what your, what your, um, what your view is, express it to your child and say to them, look, um, if alcohol, uh, if alcohol, you, know, you start to go to parties and you want to have a drink, then you've got to come back to us and we've got to talk that through. Um, and there will be some young people, I meet young people who say, uh, I can think of one, one young lady not very long ago who said, um, because uh, I often say to young people, I don't drink, and I didn't drink during my teens. And uh, I quite often get young people coming up and saying, well, how did you get through it? And um, and I, ex I tell them, and they go, but it's my mum and dad. They keep saying, well, do you want to drink? Do you want to drink? I even I had one girl who came for two years in a row, the first year, she said, my parents are saying this, and then got through that. <laughs> Last year, she came back, she said, I got over my parents. It's now my grandparents who won't <laughs> stop saying. So I think... You know, it's um, don't force it on them. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a, they're okay. They'll be okay if they choose not to. This inevitability is a is a real problem that we have. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Paul. Um, that's probably all we've got time for in terms of questions. Um, but I'd just like to say thank you so much, Paul, um, for presenting on this topic. There was a lot of fantastic discussion and practical information um, for those listening. And luckily we do have the recording that will be available on our website um, to watch back or um, you're all welcome to share with other parents in your networks. So thanks very much, Paul. And thanks everyone in the audience for being a part of the Positive Choices webinar series. As I mentioned earlier, we'd love to hear what topics you'd like to see in our upcoming webinars. So get in touch at info at positivechoices.org.au. And also don't forget our next webinar coming up on the 13th of November looking at solutions to drug use among rural youth. And that's with Dr. Alice Munro from Western New South Wales Local Health District. So you can subscribe for updates at positivechoices.org.au and we'll notify you um, when we're ready to take registrations for that one. So thanks, Paul, and thanks everybody and good night.